Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. Have you ever heard of stage four cancer? My guest had stage five cancer. That means the cancer is spread throughout the whole body. Days to live, nothing can be done for you. Instantly healed. He has such authority, you think that's something. He has such authority in the Messiah of Israel that he went to Taiwan to reach people with the good news. He was warned not to. Why? There were swarms of killer mosquitoes. One bite, you're done. I mean, this guy has chutzpah. That's a Hebrew word. It means nerve. This guy had nerve. He said, God told me to go. I'm going. So what happened to the killer mosquitoes? They all died. Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Is God ready to bring a tsunami wave of healing onto planet Earth today? Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. In 1984, the devil tried to kill you again. He succeeded. He did kill him. He was in, in a car accident, and uh, you, uh, you were with your wife and your eight children. Eight, eight children. Eight children, and uh, you literally died for 30 minutes. Right. Uh, everyone should have died, but you were the only one, only one, one that injured. did. And what was it like when you awoke? When I came back, I could see, I mean, I was blind. I could feel my eyes blinking. I could hear perfectly, but I couldn't feel a thing from here down. Hmm. And uh, I could feel blood running. I thought my eyes were bleeding. I didn't realize I had no feelings from here down until I heard someone running. And I heard a, a man on a two-way radio, and they said, shall we dispatch an ambulance? And uh, this man said, can you hold on that? The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. What was your, by the way, what was your wife and your daughter, how were they praying for you when that happened? My wife didn't know I was dead. She saw me force the sliding door open of the van and get out when the thing stopped turning upside down, flipped in the air, and landed on the wheels. She was taking care of the four babies out of the back hatch of the van that had blown open. The windshield was blown open. And uh, she thought I was all right because she saw me getting out. I don't remember getting out of the van. I was dead. I was already dead. But uh, the four older children were looking at my body when they gave up trying to do CPR two times. Each time, the hole in my head, blood blew in their face. They plugged the hole in my head. Blood blew out of my nose in their face. Whoa. They gave up. Four strangers, they're trained very well in CPR. He said, I'm not trying anymore. I'm sorry, he said to my children. That's when they left me lay there, and my four children were looking at me. My wife thought I was all right. She was taking care of the little ones on the other side of the van on a blanket, praying for them that they didn't go into shock or whatever. And then about a 30 minutes later, after they were trying to do CPR on me, my 15-year-old daughter, the oldest of our daughters in that van, pointed at my dead body and said, Devil, that's my dad. You can't have him. Yes, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I was all the way in the Milky Way at that point, and I instantly was back in my body. <laughs> Are you serious? You were all the way in the Milky Way? I am as serious as holding this cup. <laughs> 
I understand they knew how to plead the blood. How did they pray? Every one of our children, we taught them from babies. If they had the slightest injury, we, the first thing we did was prayed for them. So their faith was built up. And they saw many healings in our children, raising children. Children will teach you a lot of faith. You know that. But they were, I understand they were pleading the blood. My wife was pleading the blood when that van went out of control and flipped. And I heard her crying the blood of Jesus when I left my body. Hmm. The van was still in motion when I left my body. What happened to the hole in your head? The hole in my head uh, after the fire came to me and went out and out my toes. What fire? What fire? Well, the I, heard the four, I heard the man say, the woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. The instant I heard that, because I couldn't see, all I could do was hear, faith exploded down inside of me, and I said, Father in heaven, only in my mind, couldn't open my mouth, didn't know where it was. <laughs> I said, Father in heaven, whatever's missing on me, you can put it back on. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm going to my daughter's wedding. <laughs> and that's when the fire hit me in each temple and slowly moved down. And as it hit me about right here, my vision came in. I saw a lady holding my face with her hands, brown hair, long brown hair, white blouse. And I could see the arms of a man holding my chest down there saying, don't move. Your neck is probably broken. You might die on us again. <laughs> I, you know, when we come back, <laughs> what happens when a doctor tells you the cancer has metastasized throughout your whole body? You have 11 days to live. <laughs> but this man, this cantankerous man, <laughs> was so sure that God would heal him, he refused to believe that. Meshuggah, no. He had his sanity. He had the Bible sanity, the knowledge of God. I want you to have it. We'll be right back. We will be right back to It's Supernatural. Hello, YouTube. Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. So Henry has this cancer that started in his colon, spreads throughout his whole body, stage five cancer, 11 days to live, but you refuse to die. I told that doctor, I am not I'm sick, sick, I'm healed. I'm healed. What did the doctor say about you? The doctor said, my are God, man, mind? are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> he calls you a living dead man? Yes, I can tell by looking, looking into your, your eyes. eyes, your electrolytes well, are gone. The color, gone. I was 97 pounds. Mm. I weigh 100 and almost 70 now. <laughs> the 11th day, you go to a, a, a service that have some students of someone else we've interviewed, Heidi Baker. Yes. Why'd you go there? I was there to speak. I'd been scheduled the year before to speak to 75 pastors. Yeah, but you're dying. You're, you're, you're a walking dead man. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> they drove me to the, to the, the church. Yeah, if you're going to go out. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't get behind a wheel. I was, my, my spirit was trying to leave my body. <laughs> oh, no. I wouldn't let it. <laughs> Yeah. You expect me to interview him with this stuff going on? <laughs> oh, okay, you get to the service. These young kids, I assume they laid hands on you, or what'd they do? After I preached. Uh, you I, preached? Oh, yeah, I preached to those 75 pastors. Okay. <laughs> Leaning on the podium, they brought it down to the ground floor from up on the stage. <laughs> they carried me up there. Found out later it was angels that carried me up there from down in the pastor's office in the basement. And uh, it, it was to be kind of, in a sense, the last sermon I ever preached was what the devil was telling me. And I said, no way. The Word of God cannot lie. Jesus said, by His stripes we were healed. I refuse to give my life for cancer when Jesus gave His life for me to be healed. Um, all right. After you preached, the students prayed for you, and what happened? 
I thought somebody was poking their bony elbows right above my kneecap. I had my hands up like this. And I said, Lord, get them off my kneecaps. My body is so sensitive and I don't have the strength for that. Next thing I know, I feel my hands on my face and my bony elbows are right above my kneecap. I open my eyes and I go back and I lean back because I thought, oh, no, if I lean forward like that, I'll start hemorrhaging. I can't stop it. Blood will be everywhere. Blood was flowing out of my bowels, my urine like water, except when I was prayer walking. <laughs> the anointing was on me. I wouldn't hemorrhage. <laughs> Hallelujah. So <laughs> that's how I survived, brother. Uh, then I realized, wait a minute, there's no pain. There's no, no sensation of hemorrhaging. And I just very gently started touching myself down under my ribs, which I couldn't push before at all. What would happen if the you pain had? would have been so bad I'd have passed out. My body, the trunk of my body was so tender and so sensitive. And I realized there's no pain and I'm pushing further and further all around. And I jump up and I throw feel. my fist in the air and I it's said, I'm healed. It's over. The cancer's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, go back to that doctor that said you're a walking dead man? Oh, that doctor is crazy. That doctor knows every time I get into the state of Ohio, that doctor, my phone, cell phone rings. Henry, you're back in Ohio, aren't you? I said, how do you know? Do you see it on the website? No, I feel it. You're back in my state again. That doctor has done missions now to India and to Africa. Revolutionized the doctor's life. You know. <laughs> That's why I combine the supernatural with evangelism. Do you know that's the way Jesus did it? It wasn't because everyone wanted to hear him speak because he was the, the best speaker in the world, which he was. But that wasn't why people came to him. They came to him for the miracles. Okay. You, know, you know, go to Taiwan. How in the world, and you're warned there are these killer mosquitoes. How in the world did you go there? I was already scheduled there. Oh, and of course. Spoke, <laughs> spoke up north. The Dungeness uh, plague was down south. My scheduler said, I've canceled you for down south. I said, what for? He said, the Dungeness plague is going. Hundreds of people are dying every day. One mosquito bites you, you're dead. You go into high fever, pain they cannot control. Within four days, you're dead. I said, what did you cancel me for? He says, I don't want you dying. I don't want to call your family and tell them you're dead. I said, I refuse to give my life for a stinking mosquito when Jesus gave his life for me. So you, when you had a vision, and what, what, tell me what that vision was. That vision, we were right at the place where the most people were dying. I said, take me where the most are dying. They chartered a bus. The night before I spoke to five different churches, they chartered a bus the next morning. We went to the place where the worst plague was. Got out of that bus looking over that area and I'm crying out to the Lord and I have a vision of one little dragonfly coming across in front of me. My daddy taught us from a child, do not hurt dragonflies. They eat the mosquitoes. They're your friends. Instantly, I knew, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, that's it, Lord. Send clouds of dragonflies, send them all over the south here and eat up this plague. So what happened to all the mosquitoes, the killer mosquitoes? <laughs> A lady right behind me of the 53 screamed, oh no, did she get bit by a mosquito? They had so much mosquito spray on them, they were almost soaked with it. I turn around to touch her on the top of the head to pray for her and come against that bite, and she's shaking her head no, she can't speak English, she's only Japanese or Chinese, and she's pointing up. I look, and dark clouds of dragonflies, millions of dragonflies are right above us. You have learned to war and contend Absolutely. for what God has promised you. Your son had a prophecy of you'd be a great man of God, and he's born dead. How did you war to save him? I remembered the prophecy given one year ahead. She said, from this day next year, you will have a son, and he will be mightily used of God. Here, I, we delivered six of our children at home. We called them faith babies. Mama tossed them. I caught them. Okay? <laughs> and <laughs> the moment his head is birthed, I know he's dead because he's black and not breathing. And I, I get him turned around because the cord was around his neck four times. Mm. Get the cord from around his neck, this little dead body. 
She hadn't felt any motion for three days and nights. I hold up this little dead body and I look up and I said, Father, my two oldest daughters were right behind me and saw this in my wife. I said, it's a boy. And you said that you're going to give us a boy today and he'd be a mightily used of you. To do that, you've got to put the breath of life in him and you've got to do it now. All four of us heard the sound. <gasps> As his mouth opened, breath came in. He turned purple, then pink. He's six foot four today, missionary to Mozambique, Africa. Okay. When we come back, I have read about people being translated in the Bible from one city to another. I have had guests that have been translated. But Henry tells me, not only was he translated, but six of his friends at the same time to another place. Be right back. <laughs> we will be right back to It's Supernatural! Call now and get Henry Groover's highly anointed five-part audio CD teaching set, Keys to Power, Authority, and the Coming Glory. You cannot get this anywhere else. It's exclusive for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3233. In Henry Groover's five-part audio CD series, through testimony and anointed teaching, you will be mentored in the following. How to operate in your authority as a believer. This teaching will build and energize your faith to believe God for the impossible. How to apply the power of the blood of Jesus. You will understand how powerful the blood of Jesus truly is. Learn how to call on the blood to be delivered from harm, healed, and rescued from emergency situations. How to prepare for the coming glory. Henry Groover shares what the coming glory will look like and even practical instructions on how to prepare and align with God to be a part of the glorious, victorious end time church. Also included is a powerful testimony of what God showed Henry is now available to the believer regarding supernatural transportation. How to commune with God. Henry shares the keys to a powerful and effective prayer life and how to not only seek but find God in the place of prayer. Included is the key on hearing and recognizing God's voice. Keys to being victorious in spiritual warfare. Henry Groover shares about dealing with strongholds of a cult and your authority in a region to overcoming the invisible harassment from the demonic realm. This teaching unpacks all the protocols and strategies for navigating the invisible battles. Included on these audio CDs are Henry Groover's powerful prayers that God would watch over you and seal the teaching in your heart. Prayers for you to develop a hunger for the impartation of God's glory. Prayers for blessing, power, and communion with God. Don't miss out on getting Henry Groover's highly anointed five-part audio CD teaching set, Keys to Power, Authority, and the Coming Glory. You cannot get this anywhere else. It is exclusive for our rich Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3233. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 3233 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. We now return to It's Supernatural! Now, Henry has so much amazing, never revealed information. For instance, for six hours he was in heaven. We have to continue this show. Now, Henry, I'm on the edge of my seat. Not quite, but I'm trying to get there. Anyway, I'm on the edge of my seat. Six people from different places all translated at the same time to another country? Tell me about that. Well, we were called the Spirit-Filled Strike Force, Holy Ghost Commandos, all right? Two of them were former Green Berets in Vietnam, very disciplined men. And uh, God would tell us specific strikes all over the earth at different strategic places. And uh, one morning in Portland, Oregon there in 19, uh, 1988, October 1988, the Lord woke me up 4.30 in the morning and said, get out of bed on your knees. I'm in my pajamas. The moment, the instant my knees hit the floor, I was walking the streets of Rome, fully dressed, 
And I come to the old fashioned. Hey, now, now, I have to ask you a question because this Go ahead. hasn't really <laughs> happened to me that I'm aware of. Um, did you have any feeling from 4.30 in the morning to being walking the streets of Rome? Did you feel yourself going somewhere? Didn't feel myself passing through the atmosphere. It was like, boom, boom, I'm there. Okay, go ahead. Fully dressed. Not in pajamas. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I come to this place where in the 50s they had the big iron doors in the mm -hmm. streets, uh, sidewalks, that they load the merchandise into the stores. Mm -hmm. And I reach down and grab these big iron doors, lift them up, and a chain comes across to hold them kind of angled. And I turn back, and this is when I know the six commandos are with me. That's the first I saw them. We were all praying. Excuse me, were they in different countries? or They're from, They were from Vienna, Austria, Bangkok, Thailand, North Pole, Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Sacramento, California. God doesn't make it easy on him. No, God brought him different time frames from all over the world to put me on, put us on the streets of Rome. Okay, why did he do that? He did it because to go down there, he put us down there because he told me this is where the Apostle Paul died and where they, they killed him. This is where the apostolic anointing was bound for centuries. Hmm. I want it loosed. Now, how was it? How, what did you do to loose it? As we're going down this ancient stair, stone staircase under the streets of Rome, their prayers in the commandos, whoever had the leading of the Spirit, led. The other six stayed back, backing them in everything they did in agreement. The power of oneness, the power of agreement. This is, this is key. This is secret. Uh, secret to power being released. They were in agreement when they prayed. I felt like a giant funnel was on my head, and their prayers were pouring into my head like liquid power. And when I got to the bottom and looked, realized there's a, I'm in the entrance to a massive catacomb. And as I step into it, I look to the left, and here is a massive angel sitting with his elbows on his knees, blackish gray, just like this, eyes blinking. And the second I stepped into that room, he come up and said, you shouldn't be here. And then I hear the same thing on the right, and I turn, and there's another one. And I said, we are here by divine command of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostolic mantle that you have bound these many centuries is now loose to the church, saith the Lord Jesus Christ. And they stood up and said, we'll be going then. And their big wings spread. They had to have been 30 feet tall. They could have taken my head like the bottle cap of a water bottle and popped my head off. But the boldness and the power was on me. And I said, and you will not. For the Word of God says in Jude, verse 6, you are to be bound with chains until the everlasting day of the Lord. Great chains. And massive chains come through that catacomb, coming down spiraling. The links I couldn't reach to touch the end of one length. Spiraling, knocking their arms and their wings down, wrapping around their ankles, clear up under their necks till all they could do was stand looking up. And then... Instantly, I was back on my knees in pajamas. I was going to ask about in the Oregon, Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Henry Groover has spent over five decades experiencing a lifestyle of supernatural power, glory, and presence of God in his life. Henry wants to mentor you on how you can see the same results in your life. Call now and get Henry Groover's highly anointed five-part audio CD teaching set, Keys to Power, Authority, and the Coming Glory. You cannot get this anywhere else. It's exclusive for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3233. In Henry Groover's five-part audio CD series, through testimony and anointed teaching, you will be mentored in the following. How to operate in your authority as a believer. This teaching will build and energize your faith to believe God for the impossible. How to apply the power of the blood of Jesus. You will understand how powerful the blood of Jesus truly is. Learn how to call on the blood to be delivered from harm, healed, and rescued from emergency situations. How to prepare for the coming glory. Henry Groover shares what the coming glory will look like and even practical instructions on how to prepare and align with God to be a part of the glorious, victorious end time church. Also included is a powerful testimony of what God showed Henry is now available to the believer regarding 
supernatural transportation. How to commune with God. Henry shares the keys to a powerful and effective prayer life and how to not only seek but find God in the place of prayer. Included is the key on hearing and recognizing God's voice. Keys to being victorious in spiritual warfare. Henry Groover shares about dealing with strongholds of a cult and your authority in a region to overcoming the invisible harassment from the demonic realm. This teaching unpacks all the protocols and strategies for navigating the invisible battles. Included on these audio CDs are Henry Groover's powerful prayers that God would watch over you and seal the teaching in your heart. Prayers for you to develop a hunger for the impartation of God's glory. Prayers for blessing, power, and communion with God to be powerfully real in your life. We're so glad we got this on CD now because you don't have to take 60 years to learn these truths. You can do it in a short period of time and start walking in the same power authority and you're going to learn about the coming glory because this is a man that does not just teach. He teaches through his hands-on experience. Whole different realm. Don't miss out on getting Henry Groover's highly anointed five-part audio CD teaching set, Keys to Power, Authority, and the Coming Glory. You cannot get this anywhere else. It is exclusive for our rich supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3233. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify all Offer number 3233 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. Okay, Henry, you've, you've had many experiences with the glory of God, uh, but at lunch you told me something that everyone has to hear. You were in a church and God, where, the, where the, the glory was about to come, and God spoke to you. What did he say? Ooh, you want me to tell that? Please. Whew. Uh, there were thousands in that church, one of the most beautiful churches I've ever, ever ministered in. But I hadn't ministered yet. Six pastors at my left, the head pastor right at my left, and there are others on down the line. They're singing the song, Lord, we need your glory, send your glory. And they kept singing it over and over, and my hands were raised. I was worshiping in total agreement, yes, Lord, we need your glory. And the Lord, I heard a voice behind me, and it said, tell them to stop. And I looked around behind me, there's nothing but fake trees and foliage, and I couldn't see anybody. I thought, where did that voice come from? Why did I hear that? They're going on praising. So I went back to worshiping. The next time... I'm into worshiping again, and the voice says, are you going to tell them to stop? And that time, I, I'm looking around under the trees, thinking a technician's trying to find a disconnection or something. There's no one there. And so I look up, and I said, Father, was that you? And he said, yes. They're wooing my glory, and there's sin in the camp. If my glory comes down what they're calling for, half of them will be dead. Tell them to stop. I said, Lord, I haven't been introduced yet. You know, protocol. <laughs> and the Lord said, if you don't get up there and tell them to stop, and my glory comes much further down, the death, their blood will be on your hands. Wow. I felt weak as a newborn kitten hobbling up to that crystal podium. I thought it would come out of my mouth like a squeak, you know. I've never felt so weak in all my life walking. I got up behind that podium, and the words come out of my mouth. Stop it! You're wearing my glory, saith the Lord. There's sin in the camp. Repent, or half of you will be dead. Total silence. Music, singing stops. I hear the pastor talking. Well, what's he doing up there? What did, did he ask you? Did he ask? They're having a conversation. And all of a sudden, that is totally drowned out by thousands of people screaming, falling down, repenting, hitting the aisles, running down. So many didn't make it all the way to the front. That was at about 10 to 11 in the morning. 2.15 that afternoon, I'm still praying for people. 2.45, I look at my watch again. People are still crying. I'm going around praying. I went down off the stage. And the Lord says to me, you've delivered your soul. Get in your van and leave. <laughs> you know, there's a lesson in this. 
the glory will be the greatest thing that ever happened to a true believer. I don't care what's happening in the world. If you're surrounded with the ten of it, the tangible manifest presence of the living God, mm-hmm. nothing can harm you. That's right. Nothing can harm you. But if you're involved in sin, it'll be the worst thing that ever happened. Right. To you. And here's what I know. That glory is about ready to happen. You should be praying after you repent of your sins. You should be praying the same thing Moses prayed. Moses prayed, sure. show me your show me glory, your Lord. Come on, all together, studio audience and you at home, show, show me your, your glory, glory, Lord. Amen. And now in Jesus name, I, I must do this. I want you to make sure that you're born from above, and I want you to make sure you're right with God in every area of your life. Because if you're not right with God, that glory is coming. And you heard what would happen. Repeat out loud, dear God, God, I'm a sinner sinner. against you you. and you alone alone. have I sinned, and I'm so sorry. I believe believe the blood of Jesus Jesus has washed away all of my sins, sins. and I'm clean. clean. Give me the grace grace to overcome these areas of sin. I don't want anything to do with them anymore. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm going to spend eternity telling you. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, Henry, six hours in heaven? I haven't spent six seconds in heaven. <laughs> Unfair. I pro. No. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. <laughs> Tell me about it. How did it happen? Well, the first half hour was dead on my way to the Milky Way. I call that one half hour approximately. They said I was dead a minimum of one half hour with no vital signs because they gave up trying to do CPR. That was in ni- on Father's Day, June 21st, 1984. I think it was Father's Day. And uh, then October 22nd, he seems to love to visit me in October. <laughs> October 22nd, 1988. Uh, He says, get out of bed, get on your knees. I got out of bed. Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's that's the experience I just told you. Uh, My wife is singing a new song that God gave her to our intercessors, elderly people that have been interceding for me while I'm walking and praying Europe. And as she's singing the new song, I'm worshiping the Lord. First, I had heard the song since I come home because she wasn't with me walking. And all of a sudden, it was like somebody turned spotlights on in my face, and I knew in that home there were no spotlights. I opened my eyes and saw the golden cloud coming through the ceiling. Instantly, I hit the, the floor with my knees. The instant my, flo- my, my knees touched the floor, I was on the street of gold. I was taking a step, and I looked up and realized I'm on the street of gold. I looked down. The gold is a cherry hue of color, transparent. It's so pure. And I pulled my foot back and realized my right foot was on solid gold. I thought I'd just disappear through it because it looked transparent. And so I started walking. And that's when I began to experience the atmosphere of heaven. What's the atmosphere of heaven like? The first thing I noticed was the, the, the fragrance of flowers. I've always loved flowers. I look at the flowers on each side of the street of gold, and I just thought, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. And the instant I said, you're so beautiful, the leaves on the stems were clapping. <laughs> Their faces turned toward this golden glow that was coming. And they were singing the most beautiful song. All praise, glory, honor, and thanksgiving to the Father for creating us and making us worthy to serve the redeemed. Every living thing I found in that journey in heaven that God had created, it lives to serve the redeemed. And when the redeemed notice it and give thanks or utilize like the fruit of the tree, the whole tree goes into a spasm of clapping, and that song comes out of the trees, out of the flowers, out of the grass as you step on it and step off of it. And all of that song from creation goes back to the throne in prismatic light like rainbows. 
the words turn into light and go back to the throne. Why? God is light and the author of light. So he, everything comes from light. It goes back to him as light when it's praised. The other thing I, I noticed as I got behind a person, uh, they went to the tree that had many different kinds of fruit, went to pick that fruit, but didn't pick it. Just put his hand under it and the tree let go of the fruit into his hand. You don't need to pick fruit in heaven. The creation knows it's to serve you. And the instant that fruit was in his hand, the trees went into that clapping, rejoicing that it was made worthy to serve the redeemed. I watched the person come back to the street of gold with the grass singing because the, every blade of grass that's been stepped on is singing. So it's building into a beautiful chrysanthemum of, of, of singing and just going to the throne. He's eating all he wants. I'm following him. He gets as much as he wants. He just drops the rest. And I thought, no, don't litter on the street of gold. Before it hit the street of gold, it vaporized, <laughs> disappeared. You can pick flowers every day in heaven and put them in, your, in your, your beautiful white marble walls. They never fade. They look as fresh as the day you picked them. You get tired, you want different ones, you go pick new ones, you pull those out, drop them. Before they hit the floor, they disappear. There's no garbage collectors, no compost piles in heaven. <laughs> Nothing wastes in heaven. Hallelujah. I, I have to tell you, uh, I find this life very exciting but very challenging all in the same time. Very much. Having seen what you've seen in heaven, how do you stay here? Oh, my poor wife, for several days after that. It was October, so in Oregon, all the leaves were beautiful colors. It was the full color of autumn, and you know, and my wife loved, that's her favorite time. Spring is mine, autumn is her. And I keep saying, honey, there's no color. Everything is gray. There's no color here. And one day as we're going up the street there of Lombard in Portland, she says, honey, please stop. It's the most beautiful autumn I think I've ever seen. You're ruining it for me. I haven't been to heaven. <laughs> in heaven, there have got to be 88 more spectrums of eight colors in heaven than there are on earth. When I went through the Milky Way and passed all of those planets four years before into the Milky Way, I made the statement, every single planet is a distinctively different color. Every planet has a distinctively different song or sound. In Job, God asked Job, where were you when the morning stars sang together? He didn't know. He'd never heard them. I've heard them. The number one uh, specialist of the Milky Way, that man asked me where I got my doctorate in astronomy. He said, you answered questions for me that I have had for 16 years. I'm the world's leading specialist on the Milky Way. And you're up there tonight talking about the Milky Way like it's all common knowledge. You made revelation after revelation to me. You answered question after question. Where did you learn this? What periodical did you read? I held up the Bible. He <laughs> says, is that the Bible? Is that all? I said, all. Come on, brother. That's everything. The God of this word is the God of the universe. Let me take you back to age 17. Uh, you're working. You go by a meeting with someone I've only heard of and I've seen videotape of, A.A. A. Allen. Yes. And you decide to go in. Oh, yeah. This is when he got his original gifting. I, I like to trace these things. Tell yes. us about it. I had been in his meetings with dad since I was 12 years old. Oh, what a great heritage. Yeah, I saw the 19 tent poles fire around them. Fire trucks were all around it. They rolled up the flaps. The fire marshal said, we're evacuating immediately, okay? That was 12 years old, 1954. So that was now, flames of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's why I, I just come from night school. I started my, my first year of, of university. And uh, I see his big top. And I thought, wow, I haven't been in his meeting for years. I pull in, all these cars are everywhere. I park way out. I'm making my way in. I come in the main entrance of the, the tent, and Alan is up there, and he just, I guess, finished preaching. And he says, now, if you want to experience the power of God like you've never experienced it before, get up here. I was a runner in high school. I took off, and I beat everybody. I got the first run up on that ramp. 
His hands come down on me like two electrodes, and he released a, a <laughs> capacitor of full charge. People said, I spun in the air over the ramp. Was ro I became a holy roller that night. <laughs> I was rolling back and forth till they emptied the tent out, except for just a little, till 12, 15 people still sitting on the front row watching me. I heard people say, he's coming too. I sit up, I'm full of sawdust. I had more hair then. My hair was full of sawdust. I, my sweater was full of sawdust. And I said, wow, what happened? And they said, they told me what happened after he hit me. I went out to my car after that, got in the car, shut the door, my 1949 Oldsmobile, first car, okay? But I thought the dome light stayed on. And I looked up at the dome light, it wasn't on. But when I looked up, in my periphery, I saw my face in the rearview mirror. It was glowing like a light bulb. Amen. I look and I said, I'm glowing. I'm glowing. <laughs> Every traffic light I stopped at, people looked at, look at that guy. He's glowing. I said, yeah, I'm glowing. It's Jesus. <laughs> uh, you told me a story that fascinated me about the rabbis and the gold dust. Oh, I love that. I had finished walking Jerusalem, every street of the old city and the new city of Jerusalem for 13 days and nights, and uh, praying over Jerusalem. The Lord sent me to do that, 1989. I finished out on Bethlehem Road, and uh, I ran out of water. Liberty Bell Park is out there. And so I went to the fountain. Oh, man, you, you know what the Lord says about lukewarm water, uh, lukewarm. Whoa. And so here was an Arab. He had a little on wheels stand, and it had a beautiful picture of Coca-Cola. This is no commercial Coca-Cola, okay? But iced glass of Coca-Cola, and I'll, oh, that's what I want. I throw my shekels down, you know, and I point at the picture. I can't speak his language. And he pushes me a warm can of 7-Up, and I, I get it, and it's warm, and I push it back, and I said, no, no, Coca-Cola, ice cold, ice, pushes that back and turns his back on me. I am so dry, I've got to have some liquid. So I walk away, pop that thing open, and take a mouthful. I shouldn't have done that. I think it came out of my ears and my nose. It exploded in my dry mouth because I was spitting cotton. And so I took the rest of that can when I got done coughing, and where he saw me, I dumped it out. I didn't ask God to forgive that Arab. I'm sorry. I went over and stretched out on the, on the park bench, trying to cool off. I was hot. And all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there with my eyes closed. Somebody sits down on the end of the bench and hits my, my fingers. I look, and it's a, it's a rabbi with a long gray beard. And they didn't want to speak to me. I was a Gentile. I'd learned that in those 13 days. And so I didn't try to strike up a conversation. I noticed a young lady with about a four-year-old was swinging. I figured it was her, his granddaughter and daughter. And so I just pull my arm away, and, and I'm just, and, and then he says, he's, he's got his back to me. He's sitting on the edge of the chair with his arm up on the back of it, with his back to me. And finally he says, are you here on tour? And I says, no, I'm here on business. He said, would I be nosy if I ask your business? And he still got his back to me. I says, no, sir, you wouldn't. Uh, I said, uh, I have just finished walking every street of the old city and the new city, praying for the peace of Jerusalem. He spins around, he looks at me, and he says, but you're a Gentile. Why would you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? And I said, not only am I Gentile, sir, but I said, I am a Christian, and I believe Jesus Christ is my Messiah. I'm sorry you don't. He says, yeah, 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 I know, I know all about that. I was rabbi in, in New York. They're always trying to convert me. He says, uh, you have any family? And I told him how many children. He says, what are you doing here? I said, I told you, praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And he says, you know how many children you got? You know what that means in the ancient Hebrew? I says, no. I says, well, it means that I got a baker's dozen. I got 13. I got a baker's dozen. And uh, my quiver's full. He says, you know what that means in the ancient Hebrew? I says, no, I'm interested. Now he's talking to me. He says, in the ancient Hebrew, you have 12 arrows in the quiver. You have one in your bow. You're ready for war, young man. Yeah. I said, yeah, I'll take it, you know. <laughs> and the, the daughter looked over at me because I thought maybe we were getting into a fight, I guess. And uh, 
And I, I says, hey, there's something going on in America now here in 1989. I, I've heard of it, and I've only been in one church where it's happening. Gold is falling from heaven while we're worshiping Jesus. And it was the first he stuttered. He starts stuttering. G g g g g gold? I mean, I mean uh, you, you, you mean uh, re re real gold? Where, where, where is it coming from? I was just falling through the ceiling, coming down. A church in West Virginia, they told me, so much fell, they, they swept it up and paid off the mortgage. He says, gold, real, real gold. I says, that, that gold, they said, was 99, 9 tenths percent pure gold. And he just goes kind of into shock. G gold is falling on the Gentiles. Gold is falling on the Gentiles. I said, wow, that must really mean something to you. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. He says, in the ancient Hebrew... Before the bridegroom comes to take his bride, he always sends her a gift of gold by midnight. <laughs> he said it means the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Daughter, daughter, come, 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 come. She comes, grabs her daughter off the swing. What is it, Papa? I must get back to Nazareth. I must get back to Nazareth. I must let my people know gold is falling on the Gentile. The Messiah is coming. And he walking away, thank you, thank you, thank you. I must get back to Nazareth. Boy, I was a critic of this gold up till then, because I didn't know. I'd seen a lot of manifestations. That took the criticism right out of me. I've never been critical since. <laughs> well, wait a second now. You told me when Donald Trump was running for president, you were not a Trump fan. No, I was Ben Carter, uh, oh, Carson. Carson. I, I wanted a brain doctor. I figured we needed a good brain in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> what changed your mind? I was in Asia and woke up after a dream or a vision. Woke up, was praying, and I, I was half asleep. I don't know if I was in the body, out of the body, or what. But all of a sudden, one of my children come running into the house and said, Dad, there's a big black car and other black cars outside, and this man and woman are coming up to the house. The man is dressed like a king from the shoulders down, but he doesn't have a crown. I run to the door. Here comes Donald Trump and his wife up to the house. I opened the door, and I said, well, Mr. Trump, to what do I give the honor that you'd come to my house? And, oh, Henry, he says, never mind. This is a family visit. I said, well, well, come on in. And I set him in the nice chair. His wife is carrying a shawl, a gold braided shawl with royal jewels in it. I don't know how she'd have the strength to carry that thing. I, but uh, she stands at his left hand, doesn't sit down at the chair I prepared. He's in the big stuffed chair. He leans forward. She puts the shawl over his shoulders. And then he leans back on it. And he's saying, well, how's this child? How's that one? He's naming my children. And it's a family visit. And then he just throws the shawl back, leaning against it, stands up, which pins it over the chair and the back of it, and the top of it. And he says, well, I've got a lot to do. I'll be back. I got to go. And so I show him to the door, and they're heading just about to the limo. And I look back, and there's that shawl. And I run and grab it. And that's when I realized it's gold, and it's real jewels. I go running to the door, out the door, and the limo's pulling away in all the cars, and they don't see me. And I'm yelling, but they don't see me. And I hear a voice behind me and said, hold on to it. He'll be back. And that was the end of the vision. That changed. I started listening to his speeches and what, he, what America needs. And I could get by his language and his tearing everybody up with criticism. And I could say, that's what we need in America. I'm voting for him. Amen. But I have to tell you, one of the wildest things I've ever heard <laughs> in my life is what I'm going to ask him next. <laughs> next week, tune in. And, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you went to Korea to be able to talk to the leader of North Korea. Tell me about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I was in Sheridan, Wyoming, on my way up into Brozeman, Montana, to speak that night. And it was in the spring, late, it was early April, rather. And uh, I'm heading up out of Sheridan, up over the mountains. I get into a total whiteout snowstorm. 
All I can see is down my hood the tracks of an 18-wheeler. I'm following those tracks, slowing down to between 25 and 30 mile an hour maximum, because I can't see. And I have a vision. What a time to have a vision. I can't see anything but tracks where I'm going. Now I can't see anything but the vision. And the vision. God has a real sense of humor, you know. He really wants to show us he can really drive a car, too. <laughs> so instantly, I'm standing in the vision at the foot of Kim Jong-un's bed. I'm looking at him laying there sleeping, and all of a sudden, his head is doing this on the pillow. His eyes get big, and he sits right up, and the perspiration is just pouring down his face. And the Lord speaks to me and says, he has just had a dream that has been reoccurring again and again. I'm going to show you the dream. Instantly, he's in the middle of 100,000 people with his bodyguards all around him, very tight, making his way through 100,000 people. And all men up front, two women bodyguards behind him. And I'm focused all of a sudden in the vision on this right-hand bodyguard woman right behind him on the right. She's watching the man on the right and the woman on the left bodyguard. As soon as they're both looking two different directions, she reaches down, unstraps her revolver, her pistol, keeps her hand on the pistol. She's watching the two bodyguards like this. The instant they're both looking different directions, she draws that quick and puts it three inches behind his head. Boom! And he drops dead. That was the end of the vision. Here I am. The, the vision's over. Red lights are flashing in front of me. I'm about to rear end an 18-wheeler. Fortunately, he hadn't, didn't have his brakes on, and he was going a little slower than me, and I just barely touched my brakes, and I, oh, I come so close to going under him. And then he puts his blinker on. Well, where he goes, I'm going, because I don't know where I am. He may know this road. I go right with him. He stops. I thought, I don't know where I am. I don't want to be behind him, and another 18-wheeler ran me under him. So I slowly go around him. And I notice there's another truck in front of him because I'm watching where I can just see it close enough without my mirror hitting this truck. Nothing up ahead. I pull in front of the second truck and burst into tears. And God gives me such a love for Kim Jong-un's soul. I am weeping. I look at my watch. It's, it is 2.21 in the afternoon. I am broken. I am weeping for his soul, crying out for his soul. But I have to tell you, I have read of some of the atrocities, and that's the only word I can, I can use. It's exactly. This, how, how could you have a burden for him? How could God have a burden for him? It was supernatural, but my working, working cities with gangs so many years, he gives me such love for the guys that have got knives and throw in my throat and guns at my head. He gives me loves for them. Why can't he give me love for King, Kim Jong-un? I see. See what I mean? So. Every day from 2 to 2, 2.45, 3 o'clock, I would get alone and seek the Lord, expecting to be translated to North Korea, to the foot of his bed, because that'd be the middle of the morning for him. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. In a little over two weeks, I'm scheduled to be in Seoul, Korea. So I had been, uh, I had been invited by the Chinese government to represent the United States as the ambassador of America under the Obama administration. And uh, so I had spent days in China with the leaders of China. I had all my official documents in my passport. So I get to Seoul. I'm going to the Chinese uh, embassy tomorrow and get them to get me in to see Kim Jong-un. They can check with any of the leaders except the premier of China. I've been with them all. So they'll verify my authenticity. They'll get me in with Kim Jong-un. I get this suit on. I got my, my leather briefcase. I'm looking official. And I'm heading out my door of my hotel, and the Lord says, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to see Kim Jong-un. The Lord said, I didn't tell you that. I said, but Lord, you gave me a vision. You gave me a word for him. You gave kings. You gave prophets words for kings. Why would you give it to me? You've had me crying for his soul. I love the man's soul. I can witness to him. And the Lord said, I didn't give it to you for that reason. I'm opening doors all across South Korea. I want you to go to the pastors of South Korea. I want you to tell them the vision and tell them every day they are praying that I will kill Kim Jong-un, that having their people travail and pray for his death. If I kill him because of that, I will have to bring judgment on South Korea because they should be praying for his soul, because I gave my life that even Kim Jong-un should be saved. 
Oh. I ministered the first week there. I had two weeks there. I was invited to Pusan. 21 pastors from all across South Korea spoke to them, shared this. They melted down, repenting, on their knees, come up to me saying, I never thought of it that way. I didn't know we would be in judgment, that, that we were allowed, not allowed to have this kind of hatred for a man, no matter how wicked he is. You're right. You're right. I was so convicted when you said that. And all across South Korea, I have spoken now. And the pastors have repented and repented and called. Oh, now, does that, does that mean he's going to be saved? What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I still love the man's soul. I, I'm willing to go to North Korea. If it's my last mission in life, I'll go. You told me about his great grandmother. Actually, it was his great grandfather. grandfather. I just found you, you right. gave me the documentation and uh, a pastor had said it was his great grandmother. He might have said grandfather. As we get older, sometimes if there's noise in the room, we get the wrong name. I never checked it out, but you checked it out and documented it. He was one of the main leading patriarchs at the end of the 1800s unto 1910 of the mighty move of God that went across all across Korea. So I know that he and his family had to have been concerned and praying for his grandchildren and great grandchildren. Of course. And God hears those prayers. Amen. God wants to save Kim Chung. He doesn't want to kill him. Well, you know, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen, but what would be a greater witness for him to be assassinated or for him to stand before the world oh. and say, I repent to Almighty God. Yeah. Jesus yeah. is my Lord yeah. and Savior. I like that story yeah. better. Get saved. Amen. Amen. But the thought crossed my mind, Henry, and I mentioned this to you also. So many Christians have observed certain ungodly things that President Trump has done in the past, oh. and they, they can't stand him. They hate him. They I'm, want him. To, they're praying for his death. Uh, what position does that put them in? I hope they've listened to what the Lord gave me for Kim Jong Un, and they'll realize they're in the same boat. Yep. They're in the same boat. God put that man there. He put him there for a purpose. For the sake of Israel, we know already he put him in office and he's not going to take him out until he is finished with him. Uh, he gave me uh, anytime I get a vision, I ask God for scriptures. And the Lord told me, I think it was Hosea chapter three, verse 22 or 21 or 22 uh, about Jezreel. And I thought, what is Jezreel? What's that got to do with Trump? And so I start reading, forgetting Jezebel and Ahab were in Jezreel. I look up the scriptures and how Elijah prophesied about uh, Jezebel and Ahab, and then how Elisha told him to anoint the young man of the uh, child of the prophets, go and anoint a captain, right? Pour this box of oil over it. Pour the box of oil over Jehu's head, anointed him to be king. And Jehu goes and cleans up the house of Jezebel. And the Lord said, I have anointed him as I anointed Jehu in the house of Jezebel. I will clean up this house. I've asked you a couple more questions. Just, these are Sid questions. I want to understand. You told me when you received that great anointing under A.A. A. Allen, that things started like you will have a vision or a word. How does that operate in you? I, I can only say an impartation. Um, but what do you see? That's what I want to understand. What do now, you uh, now the Lord has uh, allowed me to see visions of where my feet are standing, of what happened there where the enemy was given license to set up an occupational center or a, a, a command center because of the innocent blood flowing into the ground. He showed me how to break that license for Satan to operate there and evict him. Uh, he's shown me how to how to break the curse off of families. I walk beside uh, my homes. I hear crying out the homes. I hear the conflict I hear. And he tells me how to pray and how to cry out for that home. I've walked into businesses and said, could I pray for you? You're about to file bankruptcy. What? 
How do you know? I don't tell anybody that. And they're looking around, see if any of the, any of the employees hear it. And I said, because the Lord told me, well, come on into my office. And they shut the door. Well, tell me more. And I've had men give their hearts to the Lord. And because they're in distress, uh, I, my spirit became so sensitive of that practicing of the walking in peace in a song. I have lost count of the number of suicides I have interrupted. Driving, walking, getting up in the middle of the night, getting in my car, going across the city, knocking on doors in the middle of the night, interrupting people. I interrupted a man in Dallas, Texas, that three times put the noose around his neck. He was he, from the banister up above, upstairs. Five times the Lord had me knocking his door and nobody would answer. So I'd walk away, think I must have missed it. The fifth time the Lord said, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking until that door opens. My knuckles are hurting, almost bleeding, and I'm knocking, and I'm looking. Is there anybody looking through the peephole? Hello, hello, anybody? I'm desperate. When the door flies open, I almost hit the guy on the head, in the face. <laughs> and he grabs me, and he says, what are you here for? Can't you leave me alone? Can't a man die in peace? And I said, you don't have to take your life. Jesus gave it so you can have life. And he grabs me by the collar, pulls me into the house, points up, and he says, you see that? I says, yeah, that's a rope with a noose. Yeah, it's a rope with a noose. Four times I've got it around my neck. I'm ready to jump over the fifth time. I'm figuring you're gone. I watched you till you were down the street. Then you come back when I'm ready to jump. <laughs> now, what do you mean I don't have to give my life? Jesus, who's this Jesus? Gave his heart to the Lord. <laughs> Henry, I have found that when God heals them of specific conditions, it's like you have elevated faith for anyone else with that condition. There are people that are being ravaged by cancer. Oh, amen. I would like you to pray for healing of people with cancer in the camera in a second, All and right. then whatever God shows you, pray. Oh, Father. Father in heaven. Father, I just speak into those that are in this room and those that are in that room, wherever they're watching this. My God healed me when my spirit was leaving my body and I kept rebuking it to come back in saying, you will not leave my body for what Jesus paid for. And I would cling to the word of God and I would read the word until all fear was gone, until my mind was clear, my spirit was clear, and my faith was fully operative. You must trust. I love the Amplified in this. You must trust, rely, and cling to the Lord. And in that, that's the way you get results from God. This cancer in me was so powerful and all, but it was not more powerful than my God. It was not more powerful than those wicked mosquitoes that were killing people over in Taiwan. It was the power of God to set them free. But we just needed to believe and set that power free to do it. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just say to you, wherever you are, whatever, whatever that has been diagnosed with, I say to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the stripes of Jesus, be healed. If you have any bitterness, if you have any thought whatsoever of anything against anybody, bitterness feeds cancer. Bitterness is the food of cancer. Ask God to forgive you. If anything came to your mind when I just said that, repent of it. Don't cling to it. Jesus can take it all. He'll carry it. Cast it on him. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and then he will exalt you in due season. The second thing you do is verse 7. Casting all of your cares upon him. Cancer has so many cares. It is coupled in with so many fears. Read the word till the fears are all gone. Praise the Lord. I would read the word. I would hug the word. I would cry and I would thank him for his word and saying, Lord, it's true. It's true. It's mine. I receive it. I thank you for it. I love you. I thank you for suffering it. Get a hold of God and don't let go no matter what. 
and God's healing is available for you. For in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I curse every cell of cancer in your body, every production of it, every of the slightest cell beginning, just that you don't even know about. I curse it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is a curse. It's a curse from the devil. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus, and I release in its place the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to begin the work and to do what his word promises that he will finish that which he has started in Jesus mighty name. Be blessed, be healed and testify to everybody. Even if you haven't seemed to have experienced the fullness of it, I had to tell people again and again, I'm not sick, I'm healed. And they'd look at me and laugh. They'd try to give me all these remedies. And I'd say, sorry, I have this one. I have the word. Let God be the truth in your life, and the truth will set you free. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So be it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Next week on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Anna Werner, and I want to share with you 100 Supernatural Encounters. They are experiences granted to me by the Lord so that I could release them as testimonies and invitations to you. So join me right here on the next It's Supernatural with Sid Roth.